everybody. Welcome to the Grammar Rock Void and to Leeds Playhouse. It is absolutely fantastic to welcome you all here. And we've got the brilliant Richard, um, who's our interpreter for this evening. Um, I'm just going to do a really quick little welcome. So my name's Amy. I'm Deputy Artist Director here at Leeds Playhouse. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces and also I heard some new faces as well. And people coming back to the Playhouse since redevelopment and seeing how beautiful it's all looking. Um, it's so exciting this evening. I'm so looking forward to this evening. Um, we've got brilliant Cara and Kate here from the British Library and from Leeds University and also a fantastic team led by Dermot and by Ellie. Um, and uh, this kind of whole evening is in the context of our Furnace Festival. So Furnace is everything we do, uh, which is artistic development here at the Playhouse. It's a really large programme of activity that involves um, artist development, the support of projects by independent artists and companies, um, our commission slate, our work next door with the Conservatoire and a whole host of other things. It's vast. Um, and one of the really exciting things we've been um, partnering with um, the British Library and Leeds University recently on is this fantastic project that they been doing to kind of really dig into um, the archives um, uh, within the British Library, particularly the Lord Chamberlain's plays. Now I'm not going to talk um, at length about that because I know Kate's going to do an introduction at the moment will be far more eloquent than I will. Um, but it's just so exciting to think that this evening we're going to share um, the work of um, the two plays buried in those archives um, that were created by black artists and um, that have been kind of forgotten and lost into those archives and how exciting, how special that here we are this evening. We're going to share these two pieces of work, extracts from both of them, with this fantastic team of actors. Um, for the first time in a very, very long time, and I don't know you're saying even kind of in this century, these plays haven't been performed. So I just feel like it's like a little moment in history tonight, everybody. Thank you for coming to be part of it. Um, uh, the kind of structure of this evening is Kate is going to give a little welcome to everybody and tell you a bit more about the project that they've been working on. Uh, we're then going to see the two extracts from the two different plays um, and then there's going to be a panel event um, and we're uh, going to be welcoming Ellie and Demo and also the very brilliant Amanda Hoxtable to join us um, for that panel event that Cara is going to lead on and I'll be kind of keeping an eye because I know we're also welcoming people via a live stream, very technological this evening, very exciting. Um, so I'll be kind of keeping an eye on questions coming in um, online as well. So I hope you have a fantastic evening. Welcome to the Playhouse. Welcome to Furnace Festival. Do come along to the other events that are on this week and um, it's a little taster of some of the things we get up to as part of Furness. and I'm going to welcome Kate on the stage. Thank you Kate. Hi, good evening everyone and a huge thanks to Amy and to Leeds Playhouse for helping to support and nurture this project. Um, I'm Kate Dossett, I'm a historian of theatre and all things cultural at the University of Leeds. Um, Special welcome to our global audience. Um, it's wonderful to have so many people here tonight and a warm welcome to everyone um, here at the Playhouse. And the two plays we're gonna be showing you scenes from tonight are Interhomey and Una Marsons at Water Price. Um, Interhomey was, is seen by um, scholars of musical theatre as probably the first full length musical comedy written and performed by black theatre makers. And it opened first on Broadway at, um, in February 1903. And then it later came to Britain where it opened in London at the Shaftesbury Theatre later that year in May. It went on a tour of Britain and it was so successful that um, the King invited the cast to come to Buckingham Palace to perform for his family. Um, I know King Charles is in
about that. Um, but also it's part of this very unique um, collection held um, at the British Library, as Amy said. And the collection is called the Lord Chamberlain's Place Collection. And it's a product of um, hundreds of years of censorship of British theatre. As many of you may know, between 1737 and 1968, theatre managers who wanted to put on a new play, a professional production of a new play, um, had to get permission and secure a licence from the Lord Chamberlain's office. So this is an archive of censorship, it's an archive of oppression, but at the same time it's an inadvertent archive of black theatre making. And one of the things we wanted to do was to celebrate this, to share it with you, and to think about some of the troubling questions that are uh, opposed to historians, to scholars, to practitioners who put on these plays. What does it mean if one of the rich archives of black theatre making is also an archive of surveillance and oppression? How do we navigate that? And what, what kinds of questions do we need to ask about this material? And you'll see later on why this, some of this material is quite troubling, because when you apply for a license for these plays, the censor wrote a report on the play. And some of the language and some of the ways in which these plays are censored is itself very reflective of the racial and gender politics of the moment in which they were written and staged. So thank you very much for coming to share this with us tonight. With no further ado, I'm going to hand over to the class of Interholy and at Water Prize. to great attempts at beautiful strains of melodious music and a pyrotechnical display of humorous humorosities. Quintessence of brevity rather than products verposity will best accomplish the purpose for which I appear here this evening. Now that I've made everything so plain that even a child can understand, <laughs> we'll proceed with business. I have here a preparation made from roots, herbs, Bugs, leaves, grasses, cereals, vegetables, fruits, and chemicals warranted by myself to do all that I claim and much more. Now, I'm not here to sell this article, but simply to advertise the greatest boon that mankind has ever known. I will forfeit $1,000. Hold on, the money so they can see. <laughs> and I will give the same amount to any dark skinned son or daughter of the genius Africanus that I cannot immediately transform into an Apollo or Cleopatra with a personal appendage worthy of a Greek goddess. Look here, Mr. Medicine Man. You expect to sell any of what you got there to anybody in this here crowd? You better bring your language down to the limitations of universal understanding. I've been standing here about 10 minutes and I'm still trying to work out what you're saying. And as Maxim says, patience ceases to be virtuous. Your impatience shall be rewarded. I'll come to the point at once. This compound, known as straight line, is the greatest hair tonic on earth. What will straight line do? Why, it cures dandruff, tear itch, and all scalp diseases at once and forever. It makes hair grow on bald head babies. It makes curly hair straight as a stick in from one to 10 days. Now straight line straightens kinky hair in from 10 to 30 days. And most wonderful of all, straight line straightens napping or not a hair. Well, in three days. I'll take me a while of that. Wait, 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 wait. That is not all. I have another preparation. <laughs> Oblicuticus. Oblic, in this case being an abbreviation of the word obliterate. Cutic, taken from the word cuticle, the outer skin, and cuss. 
is what everybody does when the desired results are not obtained. <laughs> but, but there is no word, no such word as faith. Now, this wonderful face bleach, face bleach removes the outer skin and leaves it in, in its place a peach-like complexion that can't be duplicated, uh, even in peaches. Now, change it black to white and vice versa. I, I, I'm going to spend only one day in your city, but I'm going to convince you by exhibiting a living evidence of my assertions that these two brand preparations, straight line and obliquiticus, are the most wonderful discoveries of modern times. Now, this young man, this young man is a martyr to science. Here you have the work of nature. Here, the work of art. Here is the kinky hair. Here is the long, straight, silky hair. Here, the bronze of nature. Here, the peach-like complexion. Now, remember, I leave here tomorrow for Gatorville, Florida. Give me a bottle. Give me a bottle. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not here to sell. I'm only advertising these two grand articles, straight alike. And I'll be curious. <laughs> and after dispensing a few coins of the realm, if you will accompany me to Skinner's Hall, I will place a few bottles of straight line and I'll be curious at your disposal. Now, mind you, I'm not here to sell, but merely to advertise. I'm not here to make money, but to give it away. <laughs> And the cat's out on the inside. A friend of mine gave me your address and said you can furnish anything from Chinese laundry to a book club. And that is why I write to you for a couple of detectives. <laughs> Enclosed, find two second class fares for detectives and two extra dollars if they find the cat's eye as it is very valuable. P.S. Don't forget the detectives. <laughs> Respectfully yours, Cicero Lightfoot, Box 13, Gatorville, Florida. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lightfoot, I'll see about your case. <laughs> Got enough dog in you to want every day. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't mad, sure enough. Are you shy? See, I call you by the name mother used to call you. Shy. You ain't mad. Are you sure? <laughs> no, I ain't mad. I'm here laughing because because when we were coming up on, on, on that boat from, from down south, ever since we got off it. Ha 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 ha! Ha! I'm laughing because I worked all women 
And I got work for every sin I made while we was on that boat coming up here. I'm laughing because after three days of getting into town, after working all winter, I got to blow this bass drum. I got to blow this bass drum for the Salvation Army to keep, keep myself from starving. Well, it ain't my fault you got that drum. Neither is it my fault that you worked all winter and haven't got anything. Now, I told you not to speculate with your money. Speculate. Speculate. <laughs> then I didn't lose my money shooting crabs. I lost it speculating. <laughs> it won't do any good for you and I to squabble over what can't be helped. I'm in just as bad a fix as you are. And I believe all our bad luck came through that silver box I got hauled up just in three hours before we struck the wall. I don't know nothing about your, our bad luck, but I know about my bad luck. <laughs> when that man came on board that boat with that rusty looking coat and wanted to sell that silver box, I was the first to reach out my hand and, and take it. But as soon as I seen that there was a cat scratched on the back, I turned around three times, walked back four steps, threw a little bit of salt over my shoulder. Damn. And I gave him back that box so quick. If I wasn't superstitious, I'd have sworn I'd seen that cat's whisper move. Child, did you see inside the box? No, sir. The outside was enough for me. <laughs> there was a cat's eye in that box, and it looked as if the eye was alive. You know cats have got nine lives anyhow. And if that cat ain't been dead but once, we just got eight more chances. <laughs> Look here. You ain't got that thing in your pocket now, have you? No, no. I just left the fellow I sold it to just before we got off the boat. Do you remember how many times that box changed hands before I got hold of it? Yeah. First that man with a rusty yellow coat offered to sell it for a dollar and six bits. Then I come pretty close to having it. Say. Don't you know every time I think of how now I come to having that box, it gives me the shivers. <laughs> well, you ain't superstitious. Not excruciatingly. But that cat's his bad luck, ain't it? But to get back to the subject, he finally sold that box for six bits. And then that bow-legged cook that bought it, he bought it for 13, just, he had it for just 13 minutes, right? And it got broke. And then the man sold it, had $13, after speculating with a cross-eyed barber for about four minutes and 13 seconds, and the whole box changed hands again. Just about the time I begun speculating myself. I just lost sight of it until I saw you with it just before the boat landed. And after the boat landed, it was a case of root hog and die till I stuck, got stuck blowing this, this here drum. <laughs> you don't blow a drum, you beat a drum. <laughs> If you've been carrying this drum as far as I did, you know there's a whole lot of blowing that goes in it. <laughs> yes, I blow this drum. <laughs> well, we won't argue whether you beat or blow the drum. The financial question interests me more than anything else. You haven't got a cent, and neither have I. Now, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to keep my job at Salvation Army. <laughs> nah, I don't like to hear you talk that way. We've been with each other all our lives. It's been a little rocky at times, I'll admit, but we've always managed to pull through. We've had our good luck and our bad luck, our sunshine and our rain, but we've shared them all alike together. You know, I, I didn't have a cent when I got off that boat. And today was the first time I, I actually put my feet under the table. And even then, I didn't have nothing but poking beans. I wonder. Bye, Joe, I'll ask the man to wait. Gentlemen, mm -hmm. just a minute. Are you looking for work? Not if we can find something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we would like to have a job. <laughs> yes, sir, we would. We would like to have a job, but we ain't looking for no work. <laughs> Shut up. Let me talk to the gentlewoman. <laughs> We are not engaged at the present time and wouldn't mind something light. My name is Rita. Uh -huh, and mine is Rareback Pinkerton. Allow me to introduce my friend, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, strange coincidence. Well, I almost say your names were synonyms for the job I was about to offer you. Well, if the job is as heavy as a language, 
Excuse me. <laughs> Go ahead, Miss Rita. I want a little private detective work doing in connection with this letter I hold here in my hand. I'll explain. An old gentleman living in Gatorville, Florida, being a little superstitious as he would, has lost an insignificant article to which he sets a great store. He considers the article to be of inestimable value and has offered a reward of $500 for his return. Now, I have come to the conclusion that the old man in question has not lost the article, but being over careful, has hid the aforementioned article from himself, as it were. So, I think by careful search, you will very likely find the article among some of his effects that he has overlooked. <clears throat> However, he imagines it to be stolen. <laughs> I guess we could handle the case, hey, Sherry. I hope so, John. <laughs> the lost article is a silver casket. What she talking about, a coffin? Who ever heard of a coffin made of silver? The casket in this instance happens to be a silver box, beautifully ornamented. <laughs> the center is perfectly smooth and highly polished, and engraved is a cat. What's the with your name? Uh, he has cataleptic fits. <laughs> <laughs> if you will step into my office, we'll talk the matter over. You going to be a detective? I'm going to keep my job at the Salvation Army. How does that sound? Uh, go right ahead, Miss Rita. We'll join you in a few minutes. You don't want that drum. You don't know what good luck is until you're in good luck. The silver box she's talking about is the one I sold to the fella that I just left down in Gravel Saloon. We'll go down there, bring him up here. You go in, borrow $3 from Rita, buy the box, but we won't tell Rita we've got it. Then we'll go down to Gatorville, Florida for a bluff, live a week, give the old man the box, and get the 500. <laughs> we'll get the money first. The way you tell it, 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 it sounds so natural. I could feel myself separating that old man from that $500. <laughs> if it wasn't for that cat, though. <laughs> Instead of being bad luck, a cat turns out to be our best friend we ever had. And after this, you ought to hug and kiss every cat you come across. Yeah, I gotta admit, if it wasn't for that cat, the picture of it, I couldn't tell that box from any other silver box. Therefore, I'm bound to respect cats. But as a first class detective, I ain't gonna go around hugging and kissing any other cat that I, I, I imagine, you know. No matter how much I respect them. <laughs> Come on, Sha, we're on the right path. It's a signpost. Gatorville 101. <laughs> What's that? Gatorville 100 miles yet? No, no. Gatorville one mile and some more. Some more miles? Come on, it can't be much farther. Look, you can already see the housetops. I've been having the same bird's eye view of them housetops since we got off that train. The, a detective is never supposed to get tired. Why, Nick Carter and old Sloop would laugh at the idea of a detective wanting rest. At the rate we're going, we'll be plumbed out before we get to town. Yeah, I ain't worrying about getting into town. If these people find out we just we ain't no regular detective, the thing I figure is how we gonna get out of town. <laughs> You're just as much of a detective as you're ever gonna be. I can see now you'll never be Nick Carter, an old sloop. Oh, you always casting up reflections, huh? <laughs> I ain't heard of this this man on Nick Carter or old Woof. <laughs> never heard of Nick Carter, an old sloop. Why, Sha, they're the greatest detectives in the world. 
Nick Carter is the only man living that's been shot through the heart 41 times. <laughs> An old sleuth's been knocked in the head with his arms tied behind his back, a gag in his mouth, and thrown in every sewer in the town. With that kind of treatment as a regular diet, how long is a man supposed to last? <laughs> well, I say, Shy, that ain't nothing. Old sleuth and Nick Carter were both sent out to a western town to trace up some bank robbers. The robbers got word of it somehow, and we made the train about 30 miles from the town. Imagine, a mountain pass 50,000 feet above the level of the sea. A bridge suspended in midair over a chasm 1,000 feet deep. A stormy night, the snow falling thick and fast, and not a ship to be seen. The robbers, after removing the middle span of the bridge, fled like specters down the track, and they didn't wait behind a huge bump. On the rush fast mail, every passenger was asleep, except him, Nick Carter and Old Sloop. <laughs> and they was playing pinnacle in the smoking apartment of the car. Crack, crack, crack! <laughs> Through the big black pinnacle, report of a Gatling gun rang out the midnight air. Nick Carter was seen to rise suddenly to his feet and take from the hat rack a bottle of rye whiskey, take a drink, and light a cigar and coolly raise the window to prevent the broken glass from entering the wounds made by the bullets of the bandits. Old Sleuth, always on the alert, threw a keg of beer out the window and the robber ceased firing long enough to secure the beer, by which time the train was well on its way to the deadly bridge, little dreaming of the danger ahead. Nick Carter sat down to trim his corns when Old Sleuth, whose hearing was wonderfully acute, said, Nick, the middle span of the bridge is out. I can hear the air sucking the broken wheel. Something must be done. Quick as a flash, Nick cut the bell cord with his cord knife, plunged through the window, caught the telegraph wire, which broke with his weight, attached the bell to the span that had been removed, which fortunately had landed on a bed of marsh and remained intact. Passed the other end to old Snoop, who had by this time reached the cow catcher of the engine. With superhuman effort, the spare was snatched to place, and the lives of the sleeping passengers was saved. <laughs> How deep did you say that chasm was? 1,000 feet. Then I suppose Nick Carter, having rubber soles on his shoes, hit himself on the top of the head and bounced back into the smoking department on a car and played pinnacle until he rolled into town. Nothing so unreasonable as that. <laughs> An artificial lake at the head of the gap used as a reservoir became flooded and burst its banks. The water swept through the chasm and carried Nick Carter to town 30 miles away and landed him on the platform of the depot, just as the train pulled in with old Sloop standing on the cab of the engine smoking a child's cigar. Now, I know it's taking advantage of your, your good nature to ask any more questions, but would you kindly tell me if these robbers was uh, apprehended? <laughs> now I can see you are improving. Only a first-class detective would use a word like apprehended. <laughs> yes, they were caught after a number of even more blood-curdling incidents that are related to you. Just a finishing incidentals will do but the robbers, after securing the beer that Old Slew threw out the window, descended to a valley 26,206 feet below. By actual measurements? Yes, by actual measurements. And how many robbers were there? Uh, three. Oh. Well, I believe in that part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Which part? <laughs> The part that I cut you off on and you didn't actually say. Ah, see. <laughs> the part where the three robbers actually, after drinking a keg of beer, they lay, lay down. down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, after that, Nick Carter opened his satchel on the platform of the depot, took out an airship, while old Snoop, unscrewing the top of his walking cane, removed the large electric light plant. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> you need to explain anymore. I can see them robbers was up against it. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Sean. I'll tell you the rest of the story as we get on. Hey, you ain't got to tell me the rest. Because uh, naturally, I'm ashamed to listen to you.
man with the light. Shh. Get a move on down there. Climb over the fence. It's a doghouse. That's right. Come around the back. There you are. Now, climb up this post. It's so dark I can't see no post. Here's the post. There's a ladder over there. Use that. I told you it's so dark. How you expect me to see that? Ladder. <laughs> That's it. Now pick it up. Place it here. Hurry up. Never mind, hurry and me. Stop that noise and come on. When I get up there, don't 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 let me find you hurrying me down. <laughs> <laughs> now listen here, Rand. We ain't we taking a, a mighty risk and a big chance coming up in, in, in Sir Cyro's house like this. Shh, don't talk so loud. There must be a mystery surrounding everything we do. <laughs> yes. And if we keep doing these kind of tricks, we'll be surrounded, all right, and it won't be no mystery. <laughs> Shut your mouth and listen to me. You know that the cat's eye ain't in this place, and I know it ain't here either. Now, we've got to tell this old man some fish story to keep our reputation as a detective. I don't know nothing about no fish. I have it. I know that, y'all. I'm backwards. <laughs> Someone's coming. Stand still. <laughs> <laughs> Don't seem a bit upset. Aren't you sorry to be leaving us? Don't be silly, Ralph. Of course I am. Would you expect me to go about the place with a towel around my neck, mopping up tears? You have known me long enough to realize that I don't wear my heart on my sleeve. I sometimes wonder if you even have one. <laughs> Maybe I haven't. <coughs> but you are the only one who has been clever enough to discover that fact. I'm sorry, Ruth. <laughs> I really didn't mean it. Ever. You never seem to miss the opportunity of hurting me. Goodness, Rob, you know I would not hurt you deliberately. You are such a good pal. Ruth, you think you are wise taking this job? After all, things are not so bad with your father, and, and later my dad might be able to give you some, some, some typing work to do. Don't let's go over this again. I have accepted this job, and I am going to try it. I'm not going away forever. The way you all carry on, one would think I was going off to Timbuktu. But you don't realize how much. Yes, I realize that father and mother have sacrificed a lot to give me a good education. And after all that they have done, I cannot sit around here doing nothing. <laughs> Besides, I am not good looking enough to be ornamental. <laughs> I will take that for granted. You don't care, you. <laughs> or do let's be serious for a while. You help your mother in the house and, and your father in the office. And I don't think. <laughs> all the people in the district, them love you, really worship you, and you're such a help to them. And I, why you are the, the only real friend I have, your place is here with us. Oh, well, the case for the defense rests. <laughs> Rob? Practically all the girls who went to school with me and left when I did. They're working now, though some of them have quite wealthy parents. Now you know dad's business is not flourishing. And I would like to be of some help to him. Now if there were no place for you in your father's office, you'd be in the city yourself. But I am a man. Don't you dare be so absolutely Victorian as to tell me that woman's place is in the house. Those words are only used today as a topic for debating societies. But the fact remains, women going in for work in this wholesale manner, it's, it's upsetting the apple cart. My staying at home won't write things. 
Oh, Rob, snap out of it. You're being selfish. Very well, Rob. You know, you have my, my heart's best interest. You know, I have my heart's best wishes. I mean, you will write me up and tell me about everything. You ask too much, young man. I'll write you occasionally and tell you something. <laughs> Ruth, have you ever thought about the future? About life? About love? Naturally. But why are you so terribly serious? But you're going tomorrow. It's, it's nothing. You know? What I really want to tell you is that life won't be the same without you. Ruth, can't you understand? Rob, please, don't. But you're going tomorrow. It may be a year before I see you again. If you would only promise to, to let me be the first thing I hear to ask. You would mean such a lot to me. Rob, you are the best pal that I have ever had. We have been friends since, since I can remember myself. Don't let us spoil it by your falling in love with me. It won't <laughs> spoil our friendship. <laughs> you got all that from silly novels, eh? <laughs> now, really, Rob, what do you know about love yourself? Nothing. <laughs> I want to keep away from those arrows anyway. You can't. Oh, Ruth, if, if you would stay, I could teach you. Maybe when I come back, I will. I'll feel differently. But now I want to work like other girls. Forgive me, Rob. Someday you will feel differently. You will realize that though you may be successful, though you may have friends and money, your life will still be empty without love. I don't like you a bit when you're serious. <laughs> Are you going to be nicer? Not until you promise to remember me sometimes and take the best care of yourself. I promise. Now smile. I'm smiling. <laughs> With tears in my eyes. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> you coming to the station? Well, of course. But aren't you going to say goodbye? Goodbye. <laughs> you are mean. Not mean, just lazy. <laughs> Till tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Glorious in the dogs, Paul Kid. She's in her element when Jack and the others are here. But Mrs. Baker is so cranky, I don't like to ask her after. It was awful the way she acted the last time that they were here. Mm. You surely she can't expect us to live like moms in a convent. Mm -hmm. Sybil won't stick around after her exams. And Gloria will find some place she can be herself. There'll only be Adrian Oz left. She's after Mrs. Baker's own heart. They'll be glad when the noisy ones depart. Mm. G. Myrtle. I feel so nervous. Mr. Fetzroy is late. And I wonder if he's decided not to come. He is really bringing me a book. I tried to persuade him not to come, but I'm afraid I'm not very sincere in my dissuasion. Why? Are you feeling lonely here? No, not a bit. Not with you and Gloria here. I just love to talk to him. <laughs> He's always tried to get me to be more sociable with him at the office. I don't know what it is, but every time he starts talking, I, I go all over quiver and my mouth still refuses to speak. I feel so inane and uh, I don't I don't know. Bro. <laughs> okay, but we had a long conversation this afternoon. I wonder what there was in common. Oh, he is wonderful. Mm -hmm. He has such a lovely way of speaking. Take my advice, kiddo. Don't judge a man by his talk. <laughs> Better the talk, the bigger rogue he is. You <laughs> are the <laughs> Why, Mr. Fitzroy never even tried to make love to me. 
He is absolutely charming. He is really very clever, you know, and so different from them boys that we know. Oh, I know. But he's the most dangerous types of girls like us. They start off by being fatherly and end by denying any knowledge of fatherhood. Go, go. <laughs> Put yourself together. <laughs> Maybe a little plain speaking won't hurt you. You really are such a youngster, you know. Am I? <laughs> Honestly, I am deadly serious, Ruth. There is no danger in running around with boys of our own set. Chances are, one of them may fall in love with you. And if you are sufficiently crazy, you will end up marrying him. And you struggle along, ever after, but next to nothing. Raise up half a dozen brats and all of that. But Ma, you will bear the stamp of respectability. Have the approval of all and sundry. On the other hand, you have an affair with a man like Gerald Fitzroy. And well, there is clothes and money and possibly a good time, if you can call it that a good time. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work. In the long run, the girl always pays. But Myrtle? suddenly one day she wakes up with a bong and realizes she has shattered everything that comes. <laughs> You don't think I'm that type, do you? <laughs> Naturally not, you know. But you can be swept off your feet. You are nutty about him, you know. Don't be a sin. He is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> it's jolly decent of you to talk to me like this, you know. So do you know him at all? Yes. <laughs> I have known him for years. He is. Uh, uh, that must be him. I better beat it. Why? To his company. <laughs> Not feeling well, old girl? You have a headache or anything? No. Why? Nothing. I thought you were a bit listless at the game. Mother is ill. I'm afraid I shall be going home. There are other things besides. I am sorry to hear that. When are you thinking of going? In a week. <coughs> that is if mother does not get any worse. I'm expecting more news tomorrow. I am giving him my resignation at the office then. Are you putting someone in your place so you can get your job back when you return? I am not returning. Not returning? Proof. I have noticed you seem to be a bit worried of late. I didn't like to ask you. I might have thought I was interfering. But is anything wrong? Tell me. Is it about about Fitzroy. Yes. What? Ruth, did you go out driving with him? Yes. Oh. But why didn't you tell me? When did you go? It was not that evening we discussed him, was it? Yes, but only the once. Then why hasn't he been here since? Because I asked him not to come. Why? Nothing. Forgive me for questioning you like this, Ruth, but I must no. I want to help you if I can. But why did you go? You said you would not. Because he said he loved me. Honestly. I told him I did not believe him. He swore he did. You poor kid. He tried is engaged. That is what I was about to tell you when he interrupted our conversation. If I had told you, I am sure you wouldn't have gone. Oh, why must things happen so? Fitzroy engaged? You said Fitzroy was engaged? To who? Oh, what does it matter now? Do you, do you love? Yes, I thought I did. 
I don't know. Does he know that you love him? I suppose so. Are you going to tell him what has happened? Oh, Myrtle. You are so wonderful, so understanding. I wish I had told you everything all along. No. No, I will not tell him. He must never know. I shall put him out of my life forever. And I must go through with this alone. God, what a fool I was. It was all a mistake. I see it clearly now. I can never forgive myself. On the root day. Will all come right? I have written to tell mother. To break her heart. Oh, what will Rob say? Anything is better than... You don't know what you're saying, child. You poor kid. No, please don't, Myrtle. I have been an utter fool. <laughs> and I felt so sure of myself. Look. Oh, Ruth. If it's why I really love you. If you felt sure and he asked you to marry him, would you? I don't think so, no. It would be some comfort to me to know that he was not such a cat. Surely he can't be in love with his fiance because if so, he could never have made love to me the way he did. <laughs> it was impossible. Oh, you know nothing about men, Ruth. <laughs> I wish I had been less of a prude and told you more on the base they sent. He actually made you think he would marry you. Marriage! <laughs> they know what went like magic with innocent girls like you. Naruto, life has hurt you cruelly, hasn't it? Oh, I have learned my lessons, thank God. Terrible experience Ruth can make or break one. It can give you sympathy and understanding. Don't be too hard on yourself. But what hope is there for me? You don't think me a coward, Myrtle. I can face it, but, but the others, I... Oh, Myrtle. Don't give yourself away like that, dear. Just believe that somehow light will break. I will do what I can. You look completely fucked out. Come along now, off the bed. Get some sleep. And don't you go down to work tomorrow till one minute after 10. You promise? All right, Myrtle. I promise. I can't ever thank you. Good night, dear. Such a nice kid. I will get you, Gerald Fitzroy, if it is the last thing I do. <laughs> Myrtle! You got my letter! Oh, yes, I have been expecting you all evening. I was just giving up hope. I thought you decided to drive through without stopping the no. door. <laughs> Donald had to stop on business here in Hillcrest, so I made him drop me at your place first. We must start again immediately. But haven't they given you two weeks leave? Aren't you going to spend a week with me as you promised? Yes, if you will have me. Mm -hmm. This week with my cousin, next week with you. That is the program, if it, that is convenient to you. Oh, I wish you could spend two weeks here, <laughs> but I would love it. I didn't have a chance to talk to you after I saw Gerald. No. You left in a hurry. I didn't even realize you was gone until I found your notes in my room. You see, Bob came into town to fetch his father's car and he called for me. He was in a frightful hurry. Because I was so upset, I was glad to get away. Michael, it was dreadful. But please, sit a minute. Gerald insisted that I had some reason for leaving other than mother's illness. I denied it. He was furious. 
acted just as though he knew that I was hiding something. But you don't think he knows, do you? He may suspect, but he, he can't be sure. You haven't told him anything, have you? No, he will never know. He asked me to reconsider returning and wanted to know if I need money or anything, as if I take a penny of his. And he wanted to know why I refused to see him away from the office. But I told him I was ashamed and disgusted. What did he say? He seemed desperate, mortal. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but I have never seen him that way before. As if he had lost his head. And yet he was in absolute earnest. I begged him to stop, that he was torturing me to let me go. But he would not listen. Then he proposed to me, begged me to marry him, actually begged me to marry him. And he swore he was crazy about me, that he loved me. And he seemed to mean it, you know. For a minute, I was happy. It all seemed like a dream, you know that I could hear my voice answering his. It was like another person speaking. It sounded so calm, so natural. I reminded him of his engagement to June, and I told him he offered me marriage because he thought he had wronged me. But as soon he would forget that, soon he would forget that. And were I to accept him in time, he would only remember that I, his wife, was not of his set, not of his color, and he would hate me. Then I told him too that I did not know if I loved him and he had hurt me terribly. I only wanted to get away, to forget. But, but, dear, under the circumstances, do you think you were wise in refusing him? I have thought about that. I have thought of everything and I am sure that I have done the right thing. I mean, why should I suffer so for, for, for one mistake? Let's not talk about it anymore. But I must tell you about Rob. He is. Am I not the best judge of? whether you are being fair to me or not, Ruth. Haven't I got some right to make you listen? Right? Yes, the right of, because I love you. Is that not sufficient enough reason to prevent you from smiling your life and mine? You don't know. You don't realize what this means. You are doing this to save me. You are, you're deliberately sacrificing yourself because you think you love me now. But later you'll feel differently. This is too much. I have heard enough of, of this, this in the last week. Am I, I, I'm not a, a boy changing my mind every two minutes. I am a man now. I will never feel differently. I love you now as I always have loved you. And I always shall do. I love you. Nothing can change that. Then why can't you wait just a year? Ask me again if a year, if you still feel the same. So you still doubt me? Wait, what for? Think of your, your mother and your father. Are you going to make them suffer? Uh, uh, willfully? Go through all this? And your friends, oh, I can hear them whispering now. Whispering about you. While I stand here, all helpless. Oh, God. I am oh. sorry, Rob. Why do you say things like that? I have got to speak like that. And, must, and, and you must listen to me. Can't you see I'm right? I don't know. I am so tired, I can't think. But you needn't think. Let me think for you. Are you quite sure you want to? Need you ask? No, well, there is no need for me to ask. I know it too well. Then why do you persist, my dear? I'm afraid I will sever just now. But 
I was trying to make you understand. Forgive me. No, oh, Rob, don't, don't ask me to forgive you. How could you? Ruth, if you will only marry me, we could face life together. Darling, we all make mistakes, no? I want, I want to make you happy. You deserve to be. I don't, Rob. But I shall try. For I love you. At least we have found our happiness. Yes. But at what a price. So, heads up, um, all of the plates were submitted for license. Um, I'm just going to read the reader's report for that last piece that you saw at What's the Price. This play is to be produced, and I'm going to read verbatim. So, I'm reading the words that are on this bit of paper. Um, this play is to be produced by the League of Coloured Peoples, but it seems to have no particular relation to the objects of that institution, except that the scene is in Jamaica, and some of the minor characters are coloured and speak a more or less diverting dialect. The main story is presumably about English people <laughs> and is an old-fashioned artless affair. The heroine, Ruth, is the daughter of a storekeeper in the village, adored by the coloured people and by a young man next door, Rob. She goes to be a typist in Kingston. There, her employer Fitzroy makes love to her and seduces her under a promise of marriage. She is with child. At least, we think so, but it is very delicately suggested. <laughs> Another girl who can expose Fitzroy as an embezzler makes him ask Ruth to marry him. But she refuses and goes home, and Rob, having been told by her mother about what has happened, still wants to marry her, and she accepts him. Nothing to censor. Recommended for license. <laughs> so good evening, um, and I'm sure you'll all join me uh, in the practice. That was a really wonderful opportunity to engage with those plays. I'm amazed how much uh, Ellie and, and Zoe managed to do and the performers in such a short time. So thank you so much. So uh, my name is Carla Rodge. Uh, I work in the Echo Centre for American Studies at the British Library. Um, and I've been Kate's collaborator at the library and with many other colleagues uh, in doing this work with the Lord Chamberlain's plays. Uh, it's really a delight to be up here in Leeds. The British Library's second home is, is in Leeds. We have a base in Boston Spa, which is very near. And I would urge any of you, no matter what your interest, the British Library has something for you. We are, our slogan is we are for everyone. Um, and you can and you can access our collections in Boston Spa as well as London. So British Library plug over. Yeah. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, so first, uh, here we have Amanda Huxtable, uh, she's a theatre director and writer, well known for her work to improve the diversity of the cultural sector. She's currently co-director of Vanitas Arts with Shirley Harris and is chair of RJC Dance in Chapel Town here in Leeds. Her most recent show is uh, Nine Night by Natasha Gordon, which is co-produced by the Leeds Playhouse and Nottingham Playhouse. Next we have uh, Ellie Manners, who's a facilitator, theatre maker and voice coach. Uh, she trained at Rose Bruford, Birmingham School of Acting and the Arden School of Theatre. Most of her voice and dialect credits include uh, plays utilising actors and accents uh, from the African diaspora, uh, along with some work on large-scale musicals, which I'm sorry we didn't get to see enough of today <laughs> um, as a musicals fan. Her directing credits include productions at Leeds Playhouse and with Tutti Frutti, and as a facilitator, her work is focused on creative engagement. 
Finally, we have Dermot Daly, uh, who is a director, performer, and academic. He's the Associate Artistic Director of Freedom Studios. Uh, he was nominated for Best Director at the 2022 uh, Black British Theatre Awards. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I'm going to say this, because you gave me the details. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, so should I just stop my sentence again? He was nominated for Best Director at the 2022 Ooh. Black British Theatre Awards. Uh, for his work on uh, My Voice Was Heard But It Was Ignored, which also won the Luscom Award uh, at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Alongside recent directing credits with organisations including uh, the Manchester Royal Exchange, uh, Lambda, BBC Radio 4, the Leeds Playhouse. He's also a faculty member at the Leeds Conservatoire um, and is a part lecturer at Leeds Beckett. So, welcome. Um, <laughs> so, I was going to uh, maybe offer Ellie a chance. So, we heard a little bit from Dermot there about some of the... Uh, Reading from the census report, I just wondered, maybe Ellie, first to you, what inspired you to choose Indahomey to, to, to stage? I think I was really fascinated by it being the first kind of full scale musical with a full black cast happening in the UK. Um, but also, I'm really intrigued by that first opening scene with the kind of medicine man and all this conversation around hair and around skin colour. And the stuff around skin colour didn't surprise me in any way, shape or form, but the real focus on hair kind of did when it was so long ago to already have those Eurocentric beauty standards. Um, and then also just despite that, um, it just being really joyous and funny and fun. Um, yeah, it was what drew me to that plan, yeah. And maybe, Dermot, why, why did you choose that much price? Initially, because it it felt like it could have been written now. Um, the language hasn't dated, the storyline certainly hasn't. Um, and it's actually really nice to find a story that involves black characters that isn't about them being black characters. That is just about this woman finding her way in the world. Um, and it's funny. There's like there's some real lovely moments of humour in there. But yeah, I did, it, just the modernness of it, it feels like, it genuinely feels like it could have been written last year. And I mean, as you say, the fact that it's it's so not about race that the censors didn't even see mm -hmm. race. You know, that's fascinating. I mean, it's it's, it's bizarre. It makes you reflect a lot, obviously, on the prejudices of those who, who were censoring. Yeah. yeah. No, that's wonderful. And so uh, you were both involved earlier this year we came to the British Library, we had a chance to look at a range of, of, um, of plays which uh, Kate's research had, um, had uncovered, and so you both chose these ones. I wonder if you could reflect on that experience of kind of encountering a body um, of work, and particularly in the context of a censorship archive. Um, yeah, we both looked at another play, didn't we, called Anna and Caster, Caster. Um, which I'll let you talk about in a minute. Okay. I we were in a, <laughs> if you, if you got it. Um, we were in a really grand room, um, and with, you know, faces with faces, lots of white male faces looking at us. And I think a few of us did think about, oh, what would those white male faces think about these black birth makers being in this space and looking at these plays? Um, and these huge books, some of them, and just this thought of, you know, these pages not have been turned for such a long time. Um, I think the other thing that astounded me a little was just the way in which things were just scribbled, like actually just scribbled out, weren't they? So there was lots of things about God that was scribbled out, lots of things to do with religion, but you know, kind of really racist language was completely acceptable and just there in black and white without any scribbles whatsoever. So that was quite, yeah, taken aback a little bit, especially thinking about then these white faces watching us. Um, but yeah, it was really magical actually to be able to to be in that room and experience those players with lots of brilliant historians who, make, who knew so much that I didn't, uh, it was brilliant as well. I think it's bonkers, just <laughs> yeah. generally. Um, I, I'm sorry, Luke asked in a minute because I remember the reason why that really got me. But I remember picking up um, at what price. I do remember picking up and it is, as I understand it, the, the, the copy that's in the British Library is the only known copy of that play in the world. Let's just sit with that. It's a play by a Jamaican playwright who lived in England, and it's the only known copy in the world. And we didn't know it was there. <laughs> I think that there's something, there's something about holding something that was held at some point by the person who wrote it. And we weren't on the planet at the same time. 
There's something really magical about that. There's something also really sad about that. I had not heard of this this person before going and having a look at that archive and learning more as I have done about her in the research for, for this. She was the first um, black playwright to have a show on in the West End. What? And we don't know her. Um, you know, she was uh, the first black producer at the BBC. She was mates with George Orwell. How do we not know about her? I mean, I'm, I'm asking rhetorical questions. Um, but I, I find that fascinating. But yeah, going back to Anna Lucaster, the, the census report, and I cannot remember the exact phrasing, but the census report, I remember I, I remember calling you over and saying, can you have a look at that? Because have I just read it? I cannot remember the phrasing, but it was the most racist thing I have read. And I've read a lot of stuff. Um, and I live in this skin, in this country at this time. It was the most racist thing I've ever read. And it was just there. It's a matter of fact thing. And I just, I couldn't get my head around it. Could not get my head around it. Um, well, I'm also, I was just going to say that I think one of the reasons it's so disturbing is it was language used by somebody in an official capacity. Yeah. This was, a, this was a, a, a functionary of the government who expressed themselves, you know, and in, in, you think in a creative, you know, in, in what we should be a creative field. I think that definitely has additional power, going back to what Kate was saying about yeah archives of surveillance and censorship for sure um, but I, I as somebody who works in a library I just have to say you know your account of the magic of touching materials and being kind of there mm. you know as a as a, a, a link to to people you can never contact you can never you know engage with otherwise is really is really wonderful um, thank you so then turn to you um, Amanda just say you know what what does this all make you think about your practice? You know, as a as a you know an active you know, producer of, of theatre now. You know, how does learning about these materials from a hundred years ago? What does that make you think about? Well, the first thing I have to say, um, thank you for mentioning the name. It's important that I mention it first. Um, we recently lost a cast member, Josephine Melville, and she'd have loved tonight. She was an archivist, and she collected the history of our stories. Um, and I mean, obviously she couldn't have done that in the last hundred years, but she certainly did it in the time she was here. So I wanted to kind of celebrate that and mention that. Um, I had the privilege of sitting in the front seat watching that extraordinary film, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and what it makes you think about is uh, if players could talk, and of course they can. Yeah. If they could say, so you'll find me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the context that they found in in terms of censorship is really interesting. There's so many people in the house that understand what I'm talking about. Joe Williams, he did an Abraham. Uh, you know, to preserve and, and protect, but that's not what the purpose of that the collection was not to preserve and protect, it was to hide and, and, and ensure that we didn't see it. Of it. Although that license said, we're good to go, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. Good to go, <laughs> if they'd known about the detail. I think it's lovely to, uh, plays are to be heard. And so thank you. Thank you for the timing, the rhythm, the journey, the energy that you gave to every part of those words that were given by that writer. Um, and thank you for the direction of that, because that's the bottom line. It was written to be heard and to be felt and to be understood. And so in terms of my practice, to, uh, to know that there have yet, you know, we're finding uh, things we didn't know, the hidden stories, and when we say hidden stories, we mean it. You know, we are, while we're here, let's find them and let's interpret them, let's reinterpret them, let's find out what they're trying to say to us. Clearly, I mean, for me, uh, I've had the privilege of being in spaces to, you know, read, read and read and read and help writers read it, you know, I read it for a prize uh, and I've read for Yale as well. And so I've had the uh, great opportunity to read across the the, the world, you know, I was able, I've been able to see the patterns of scripts. And so when we have the chance to uh, hear, it's like time travel, right? Mm. It's like time travel. And then you can connect and go, oh, so that's exactly the same. <laughs> you know, move on. It's like, or, oh, I hadn't thought that they were that modern. They're not modern at all, it's just humanity, right? Um, sex is sex, right? And that's that. I love the way they reported that delicately thought. You know what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> the way your eyes are growing. I love that. The, the, the non-verbals are great. Well done on that. Um, 
Yeah. So for, in terms of practice, obviously I've had the privilege of being right up close, watching, hearing and feeling every moment. Uh, I think I hear what you're saying, Dermot, about the sadness, but I think I'm going to live with the joy of thank God they're here. There's a sadness yes. in terms of, look, I wish, listen, science fiction, fantasy, I want to be time traveling, I want to be everywhere, I want to, you know, and this is the best way I can do it. If I, you know, we have to remember the, the, the context of what we're finding then we are the fortunate ones to be here at this point, this moment, this time, to be dealing with what it is to be us. And they could never have imagined us sitting here uh, talking uh, with, you know, a, a wonderful audience about this moment. And the master would have definitely had a radio show about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. I can't bring the BBC to this, but we do have <laughs> we do have our international audience uh, on the on the live stream. So, uh, if you have questions, do uh, do prepare them. Um, I'm just going. Can I just yeah. answer what Amanda said? There's something about stories in the world, mm -hmm. and I tend to think <laughs> that stories shape the world in which we live. And if stories aren't there, then what world are we living in? It's really important to find these stories. It's really important to, to, to share these stories because they broaden our scope. They allow us to see more. They allow us to feel more. They allow us to see the world in a different way, in a better way, in a, a more open way. Just to add on to what you were saying. Well, the one thing I wanted to pick up as well for gathering their, their thoughts for the questions um, was I mean, all of you obviously have opportunities particularly to, to interact with with younger playwrights, younger directors, performers. Um, and that was, was something that came up a lot in the discussions that we had around the plays when we all met at the library. And I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit on what you think of the value um, of these historic materials in a sort of education context, really. Knowing that there are roots means that you can grow further. I'll leave it there. <laughs> No, that's true. And I think it's particularly thinking about what you were saying about Una Marsden and I'm like a really early career director and I think knowing that there has been, it's so good to sit, be sat here with these people who have gone before me who have done just brilliant things. But whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> There's also these people like 100 years ago that I just didn't even, before now, didn't even know existed. But that means a lot. It really does mean a lot. Um, so... Yeah, and then I'm going to pass that on to all the young people that I work with and say we were here and we were doing this and this is this is ours just as much as anybody else's and it can be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think in terms of education and writing, I'm always going to say, you know, I, okay, over the COVID period, which we are still in, I understand, but in terms of the lockdown moment, I had the, the honour of working with a lot of writers. And one of the things I say and work with in terms of black writers is um, be free. So I think it's really interesting in terms of the censorship and commissioning and audiences. Because one of the things we haven't got here is the audience that they're playing to. Mm -hmm. Who are you writing for? What are you censoring already about yourself? And how can you be fully free? And I think there's something about the writing here that it's certainly with the, the, the Jamaican text that uh, there's a freeness and understanding of language. I mean, you know, okay, thank you so much for allowing me to have the scripts quickly in terms of the plugging in one, where you could, it's the language written down, the oral language written down. And so it's about the ear and what you're hearing every day and you're not speaking to others, you're speaking to yourself with your, you know, media. So I think that's really, really interesting in terms of um, freeing yourself and not censoring yourself and just, just writing find for yourself mm -hmm. um, and whoever wants to join in and hopefully it'll be a thousand of people. But, you know, that's what I think is really interesting in terms of this channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got any questions for our esteemed panel? Okay, up at the back. Um, I came to the call uh, for Joe and um, I came because I was especially interested in what was being presented to you mm. um, I'm fortunate because I know about her work, and I've known about her work for a number of years mm. as both a playwright and a poet and a journalist. And I think it's really important that it's just something, it's a question as well as a comment. 
that's okay. I think it's important that um, not just as black people, but as people, we research archives. And just going by what Amanda said, we just the importance of archiving, researching archives. And Union Nelson's work, um, <coughs> funny enough, um, has been available for a long time in culture form. Black Union Leeds, people to press, um, who acquired an archive of her poetry. But also, um, I think it's important that when we're kind of looking at people like Union Nelson, that we kind of draw a bigger picture about why she would write that particular play that we presented, mm -hmm. and also other plays. And it's really about her experience. So I think the question is, in your research of the archives, what other information do you come across in regards to Julian Marcel as not just as a player, but as a person, mm -hmm. and someone that was living and learning at that time? So just before you answer, I'm just going to repeat no, the question yeah, yeah. for the benefit of of, uh, of our international audience. Um, so it was it was a question about um, Una Marzen and uh, the fact that she's been better known as a poet. Um, the People Tree Press here in Leeds has produced uh, collections of her work. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, comment, the comment was uh, though about the importance of um, trying to place uh, someone such as herself in context, thinking about his, the importance of historical context. And so it's a question about what uh, what what additional things have you learned about her as a as a woman living in in thirties you know London and how that informed your reading of the play? I I, I, I knew nothing. So I read that I knew nothing. I didn't I didn't know she existed before I read the play. I didn't know who she was. Um, and think to your question, actually, it's really that's really interesting. Actually, why didn't I? Was a question that still worries me um but the way the play is presented within the archive is you've got uh, the reader's report in one folder and the play itself in, in another and there's no other biographical detail so some plays you will have a, a large amount of correspondence between the producers and the and the chamberlain's office or chamberlain's office but with at what a price it was it was just that reader's report there's nothing else so everything else that I've learned about Marson has been after the fact. And I'm still learning. Um, you know, I, I've obviously I found out she was a poet, I learned that she worked for the BBC. Um, I found out that, and it's, it's, it's something about pictures. There's, there's a picture of her and um, Orwell's, at the, no, she sat at the microphone, Orwell is sat above her, or stood above her, I think T.S. Eliot is stood next to, sat next to, do you know the picture I mean? And I've known that picture for years. And I did not know who she was. But she's right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. But I was introduced to that picture as, as a picture of Eliot and of Orwell. I was educated in this country. I think, to kind of answer your question more broadly, I think with any of this, We've got to be careful not to read too much biographical detail into the play because it is, after all, it is a work of fiction. However, from what I've, I've read, some of what is in At What A Price was based on what she experienced. And obviously as writers, your experiences go into, into your work. Um, and I think sitting all of these plays within a wider context of who wrote them, why they wrote them, when they wrote them, um, who they wrote them for is, I think, I'm looking at UK, is the next iteration of this, this research of pulling all of that together. Because in isolation, it means nothing. In isolation, it's, it's a lovely play. It's a brilliantly written play um, that, as a, as, as a theatre maker, thrills me. But as someone who is interested in histories, someone who is interested in how and why, that play doesn't give me everything. So I think sitting within that and also being able to look at a picture that I've known for 30 years and knowing who that woman is. I, 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 don't, I don't know what more to say, Khadija. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from, I'm sorry. I feel like I've let you down. 
Well, I was also just going to add, if, um, I imagine some people in the audience might have seen it, but um, as part of the BBC's 100th anniversary, there's a documentary um, about Unimars and which um, I think Lenny Henry's production company uh, made. Oh, it? Um, and it's on iPlayer Excellent. at the moment. Um, and it's, it's, worth, it's worth watching. It covers a lot of the biography. Um, it obviously focuses more on her work. Um, and I was just, I was just interested in the section where they mentioned the play. Clearly, the people who commented on it had not read it, um, just because it's hard to find, as we've been discussing. So I thought, you know, but well, you've got one up on them. Exactly, opportunities to grow knowledge. Um, so we've got any any more questions? Yeah, I'm not going to look at the moderators. Um, There's just a comment from uh, Susan Croft, who's um, online. She's great to have you in Marsden. It's a great recognition, raising the race of the ACP documentary. I just wanted to mention Dear Jarrett McCauley's biography of her as her other two plays, London Hall in 1937, or Student Life in London, and Pocomania, Pocomania, Peter, Pocomania, great, from 1938 on the revivalist religion. Is there any chance that the project publishing all of her plays and other books? Yes, Cara. Okay. Is there any okay. chance of the British Library to these plays? So, the, um, yeah, so, the, so the, the, the comment was about being pleased that that, that uh, Martin is getting more attention um, and also commenting that there's there's two other plays uh, that she produced. So those two plays have been published. So they were published by Blue Banyan Press, I believe, uh, in Jamaica, um, maybe 2016. So yeah, sort of about, you know, five years ago. No, the same age as my son, six and a half years ago. Um, so, uh, so those are available, and that was uh, for those of you who, who are geeky and like history. It was an interesting moment in Jamaican copyright law, where basically one load of laws were coming were no longer applicable, and a new regime was about to start. And there was a little window where Marsden's work was out of copyright, uh, but it is now closed. But they published both of those, and they but they didn't have access to what price for the publishers to produce it. Um, as part of the project at the British Library, um, the Echo Centre, where I work, has funded the digitisation of a number of the plays, which were which are included in the Lord Chamberlain's plays, and at what price is one of them. So you can now read the whole thing online. It's the manuscript, it's photographed, so you actually get to see the place, which, is, as Ellie says, it actually has a, has a lot of magic in itself, and you can see how, um, yeah, often, you know, there's actually, there's edits on the page, because so you can tell, you know, authors, you know, it was it was hard to copy things in the past. You just sent a copy that you had, you know. So that's I always find that quite a, a, a exciting moment. Um, but yeah, there's a link I think in, in the program. Um, for those online, the program is available digitally. Uh, there's a link to it, and those of you here, uh, so you can yeah you can find the census report um, and the, the whole play script. So we've uh, we have published it to a to a certain extent. We have it's not a it's not a, a reproduced an edited copy, but it is. Um, I think it helps you get and it. it Get a sense of the archive, which I think I hope people will be interested in as well. I suppose with like diseases of women's language is like quite passive when it comes to the like the institutional British mm -hmm. Library itself. I'm just wondering about you know talking about accessibility and access and pay. So what's the role of the library as a gatekeeper as well to these archives and a lot of people who never get actually enter the library or necessarily enter the archives. And, and your experience as well, kind of accessing the library in that way. And I just like, how do I know these posts that actually there is, there is something also in this room? Yeah. And these posts are um, those kind of questions and how, how those kind of dynamics work as well. Yeah, no, thank you. So that was a, that was a, a question about the role of an institution like the British Library as a gatekeeper for, for these kinds of collections and the, the politics around who gets to, to access them. Um, no, and I think that's a very that's a very fair point, and that was something that you know that one of the reasons why Kate and I started talking about it is the fact that it's a very physical collection. It's actually the 20th century materials you have to access through a card catalog if you come into the reading room. There's, you can't even search them online. Um, part of the project work that we've been doing is actually digitizing that and getting the catalog online, which will at least enable people to know what's there without having to come into the into the room. So it's the largest manuscript collection that the library cares for. Um, obviously, uh, as you know, I said at the beginning, our mission is to be for everybody, and we are very conscious that that has, you know, that that's often historically meant it meant academic researchers; those were the people who came and used the library, um, and also meant senior academic researchers. There was very much not even a culture of welcoming in undergraduates, um, and the, the library has made strides in the in the past. Uh, definitely sort of 20 years to sort of to open itself up and make itself more accessible. But we're really conscious that, you know, caring for 170 million items 
you know, we can't, we don't have the money to digital everything. We're we funded by the taxpayer. You know, we, we, we can't make everything. And also sometimes actually that digitization, it's great, but you also want to be able to actually invite people in. Access, physical encounter is, is also important. So it's, it's finding ways to do that. So this project was really a wonderful opportunity for, for us at the library to think about shining a spotlight on an under-researched and under-understood part of the collection. Um, but we're also very conscious that, you know, that encountering, you know, incredibly racist and damaging material as a researcher is an unpleasant experience. And to, to think about how do the structures, how, do, you know, how does research culture not support, you know, people encountering difficult material. And so that was when we had the, the day that you're talking about when we brought everyone in. Mm. Um, Kate and I were talking about it with other colleagues in the libraries that we wanted to make it what we call a chatty reading room. We didn't want people to have to work in silence, you know, to have to encounter this, this material one-to-one. -one. Um, and so I, <laughs> so, and there was talking, which was what we wanted, you know, and so I think it's, there's a lot of things that we need to keep pushing the boundaries and to keep thinking about, you know, how, how do we, invite people into to, to, a, to a large research organization where this material is but people don't know and if you don't if you don't make yourself accessible and available also recognizing the fact that there are you know continue to be barriers and how do you keep pushing at those um so anyway i'm really not the one who's meant to be talking i'm sorry this is very much <laughs> meant to be but i do think it's important and i, I think it, it's, it goes to the heart of why why we wanted to do it and i'm so glad that you know we were, we were able to work with creative and wonderful people such as yourself to, to really bring these to life. I think there's something about taking the work of two people. <clears throat> um, I know that's a cost implication. Um, but the idea that we we had to, so we're all based up here, uh, that we had to get on a train to go to London to we had to sign up to get our British Library library card um, and then be shown where to go. And the plays had already been kind of taken out and put in the reading room for us, but we were shown how to access them. Genuinely, I think I'd find it quite difficult if I was doing it on my own, if not impossible. Um, and I think that talks a lot to the, the impenetrability, the gatekeeping that, that, that you mentioned of, I know they're in that building, but if I went there tomorrow, I'd have to give you a ring and say, Cara, give me a hand. Because I, I wouldn't know, I know which floor to go to and say the right, but where are they? Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I, wouldn't, I don't I wouldn't have sense. the answers. I want to point out, you don't just have to phone me. <laughs> you well, yes. However. <laughs> you have my number, so that's fine. But no, you know, there's, there's, you know, there are reference staff in all the reading rooms who are there to answer questions. And, and, but it can feel intimidating. You know, I remember as a student, I, you know, I, I never asked, I like to say this story. I wrote a whole PhD thesis thinking that I couldn't look at official government, US government records because they were all in Washington. And I had no idea that they were in the British Library until I worked there. And, you know, so, yeah, you can, it, it, yeah, no one's going to get it right all the time. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I want to assure you that somebody will help you find <laughs> I just, I, obviously, I wasn't there at the British Library. I wasn't part of that journey. I'm just here at this point in time. I think it's interesting in terms of the, you know, the very language itself, British Library, and what that means. And Cara and I had a quick conversation before we came on about, kind of uh, access nationally to our, our records and I mean our records in every way. We have our, uh, an international audience tonight and it's good to know that people are here from you know from, from Jamaica listening in um, to uh, this journey. Susan Croft has just uh, shared a, um, a question and she has been part of this journey of archiving and then and taking care of the, of the heritage for a very very long time. So in terms of access it's not it's, the, the builders are important, but I know for a fact that there's more outside the buildings that have been taken care of. I know that because of people who are in this space. You know, I, I'm very excited about the digitization of the work and getting more to each other. You know, as soon as you talk, I'm on it, looking to find it on here. Right, that's it, that's the network. You know, it, they, they belong to us and it's for us to be in the spaces. I know it's taken us far, you know, it's not taken us far too long, it's taken the time it's taken. So in terms of the people who are in the buildings, 
uh, looking more like this room than, than, than not. And I mean that in terms of our panel as well. And that's the work that happens with institutions all over our country. And we push forward with that. You have to excuse me. My son's 26th birthday and he's trying to call me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, happy birthday! <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have. Um, I would so have to put your hands up the panel on the camera over here. Yeah, we're all online. I'm also aware of timing. So, is that more? Yes, right? no, go for it. It's, 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 you, you can see better than I can. Right. So, thank you very much, Jordan, for what you said. So, going back to um, the unknowing of who Mars was in the photograph, I'm just holding that image for a moment. We knew who the white men were around her, we didn't know who she was. Um, I want to centre a quote from Claudia Rankin from 2016 Guardian article where she states and says very clearly the invisibility of black women is astounding. Mm -hmm. So how might we best in the contemporary in the 21st century understand Marson as not just a moment, mm -hmm. as a metaphor? And that's the whole panel. Oh, that's a big question, Michael. What are we doing tonight? Thank you, Dr. Remy Smith. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. So it was, it was a, a question about, about Mars and, um, and thinking about the photograph and reflecting on the invisibility yeah. of her as a black woman and how we can think of her perhaps not just as an individual but as a, as a metaphor for, um, for black women, I think you mean socially and also as cultural producers. It's a big question. Landed a big one there, unnecessarily so. Thank you for the reminder. I opened my conversation with the name Josephine Melville on purpose. She lived her life loving black theatre and working hard for it, collecting the theatre posters the, to make sure that people understood that it was made. You know what happens with theatre? It's made and it's gone. We now are in a place of digitization to be able to capture it, but if you weren't at the moment there, you missed it. And so she absolutely celebrated and worked tirelessly to make sure that those stories of every production that has ever made in her lifetime and before that was um, gathered. It was part of a, um, a series of, of exhibitions that were made that hopefully will continue to be made. And so the invisibility of that work, we found out more about that when she passed. And that's the reality. That's the reality. It's every day that we are invisible. And that's why I made sure I was here tonight to say that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Should we take another question? Mm. Okay. If any of your thoughts come back in. Yeah. Uh, for for theatre members in the room. Uh, what are the challenges or, or successes um, things to think about when trying to revive history through theatre? Um, uh, what, what, what kind of the, the, the blocks that, that you guys would recommend maneuvering around when you are, are telling history? Okay, so thank you. That was a really great question. So that was one about the contemporary um, theatre makers. What are the sort of what are the blocks or the challenges of, of trying to incorporate these these histories, these stories? I would say feel it before you think it. Feel it before you think about it. And think about it. And think about it before you find out. Because if you go the other way around, what you're doing is you're imbibing other people's feelings and other people's thoughts. You need to come to it fresh. And then layer around that. It would be my take. I don't know about the other two brilliant people. Mm -hmm. Mine was just the language was the challenging. Um, what you didn't see from Indahomi is that is um, a Chinese character who is referred to in really awful ways. Um, so it's how you manoeuvre and what what choices you make. Therefore, um, so I had to be really, I had to think really carefully about which scenes I wanted to choose because of that. Um, but also without pretending that it isn't there. Do you know what I mean? And for this moment, that that wasn't. But if I was to use the shirt at the play, how do you, yeah, how do you then show that carefully and um, pretend it's and not pretend it's not there as well? And I think that also speaks to Romy's question: is by not pretending, by pretending, 
Go back to that picture. I can't. Sorry, I'm going to think about that for a long while, Ronnie. But thinking about that picture, there was a pretense that she wasn't there. Yeah, there's a balance, isn't there? Yeah. Like you have to strike between being honest and open about what the time is, but also what that means. You know. I don't have the answer. It's <laughs> a great question. I think it's always a bit of like a, um, a creative. It's always easy to put yourself in. It's always easy to see yourself. That's why we choose. We are constantly centering, and, and we think we're not, but we constantly make it. Is, is this play can you know relevant now? That's why we choose it. We've got Charlie and the Chocolate Factory next door uh, for a reason. Perfect piece we told in the you know crisis, right? Um, and, and apparently it was originally supposed to be a black boy. So that's an interesting take on it. You know who gets to tell the play and why. I think one of the challenges is to not force yourself onto a play because that's what you want to say. Is what is this play to try and say? So that's the kind of, you know, exactly what you're saying. Really. Really. It's that thing of, you know, don't place yourself in something that isn't there and force it. And there's all, you know, if I'm going to get into, you know, the history of the thing, which is the thing that I do, then it's the obvious one, which is look at the context it was made in, you know, just get the whole, I always do that anyway. And, you know, if I'm in a room, I'm always wondering whether all of us were a hundred years ago from there. Mm -hmm. So that just kind of gives me a question of how we got here in the first place. Mm -hmm. We don't turn into a room at the same time. It's, some of us took a bit longer for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we maybe have time for one more question or yes. Joe, I guess we do I was gonna say something I'm just joking, about uh, <laughs> Congratulations and then Joe, yeah, all right. I was just going to say something about um, looking at like historic plays and how to make them relevant today. And just, I think, I think as an actor, that can come from choices in performance as well. And I always think mm -hmm. about like Stanislavski is an actor from hers, but then there's an actress from hers, and how can you then put like a, a feminist take on something that was made or written out of? Mm. out of the time frame of what is seen to be okay now or acceptable now and how can you still stay true to the text but also give like female characters for instance a little bit more autonomy in the choices that you make mm. uh, in the way that you play those characters that's, that's what I was going to say I was going to say I think just don't break the play don't break the play no you can't break it to do your own play it's not fair because you're just you know, write your own play that's what it is <laughs> I, 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 I did love some of your choices no one verbal you placed it on top anyway there in the yeah. eyes, you know, it's just like, you know, oh, well, you have to make it so we can do stuff can't uh -huh. on top of the play, but just don't sink the play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Joe Williams, um, who's very stable. Um, I've, I've chosen for the past 20 years or so to actually engage actively with archival mm -hmm. It's been incredibly enriching. Um, and the place that I saw this evening just wanted to thank everybody, directors, actors, playhouse, the Lakewood Centre, for making it happen because then you get your sessions like this. And the discourse is what's really, really important. Um, but seeing in the only in particular is just really, really eye opening because if you recall the 1950s um, road movements, as they're called, Abbott to Sterno, Bill Crosby, and Bob Holmes. That was the origin, you know, and then that's when these things started and get bright and it's a, and the lower, you know, the lower that's right down to more green wines and so on and so on. So it really is a very enriching story. Um, you've got very good here in the Pablo Fan, and he had to um, adopt minstrelsy into his sense for buns on seats, and it was something to break into it. So, Everything about what we've seen this evening is, is about race and how Una Martin actually challenged that to the back point. Um, Ala um, Paul Robinson, and if you go back to the mountain center, there's Harold, who's really Shakespeare, as a black Shakespearean tra tragedian, at a time when black people to be on stage had to black her, thicken their lips, and widen their eyes, and were black performers trying to. Fight against them and you will into the stage. And in terms of female actors as well, you have Ira Aldridge's daughter, Amanda Ira Aldridge, who few people know, coached Paul Robeson 
in his affair in the 20th century, their father was the 19th century, and that's a wonderful bridge. And it, it has been a kind of degradation and a kind of pricing. And I would see it. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Phrase. Joe was, was far too eloquent, um, thinking a bit about the, the histories of, of black performance and struggles against minstrelsy, particularly, um, which I know is something that attracted you to Indahomi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did read an article about it and about Indahomi being purposefully, the way in which it was brought to the UK was to fight against minstrelsy. Um, so yeah, just agreeing really with what you said. Yeah. Okay, so are we... Okay, so there's just a, a comment from somebody called Connie who says, uh, Wokamania is being staged in London by the decolonising the archives um, at this echo, or we look everyone to the call, the project will engage audiences to talk about revivalism and sense of religious practices that's on the horizon. Um, yes, thank you so much for coming on. Fantastic. No, that's thank you so much. So there's a production of Wokamania coming uh, in London. Um, which we all need to, to look out for. So maybe I think you could talk. Maybe you could talk to this space. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> mm, just saying. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, once again to our, to our panelists and to our performers um, for a really, really special evening. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.